A special guest on today's show, some wrestling royalty, who's also a huge Browns fan. We'll also get into the defensive coordinator situation. Who should it be? Who shouldn't it be? State of the Browns, best bets with some sick picks for NFL wildcard weekend. Let's go. Sick podcast with Andy McNamara starts right now. Turn up your volume. Because you're about to listen to The Sick Podcast with Andy McNamara. The sickest Cleveland Browns podcast. Cut back by Chubb. He's to the 10. He's still running to the 5. He dips outside left. He's going in. Touchdown. What a run. Nick Chubb. It's going to be sick. Welcome, everybody. Well, another NFL playoff season and no Cleveland Browns in it. We'll get to all that. The defensive coordinators mentioned today it would be brian flores interviewing jim schwartz Gerard mayo as well so that whole process is cooking we'll get into that also hey there, there are a lot of even though the browns aren't it there's a lot of fun wild card matchups this weekend so we'll try to win you some cash too, get into some sick picks a little bit later on but folks you know if you watch the show i'm a huge wrestling fan and i've been a, a giant fan that's an understatement of my next special guest for years and years and best of all he's a diehard cleveland browns fan just like the rest of us let's bring in hall of fame wwe commentator wrestler announcer artist author jerry the king lawler jerry welcome sir how are you oh hi my friend i'm i'm doing great i'm i'm really excited to be here especially uh to talk a little bit about the cleveland browns uh, you know i live down here in memphis tennessee now and uh Sometimes I feel like I'm the only Cleveland Browns fan in this in this whole state. But um, anyway, so yeah, I'm I'm really glad to be here. Excited. Well, I'm with you. I'm up in Toronto, so I feel you. It's all Buffalo Bills territory oh. up here. So I'm, uh, you know, we we get and Jerry. I was I just finished watching some of the Tales of the Territories, which you did a terrific job in um, for Vice on on the Memphis territory. And I hope I can be one Andy that you don't pile drive, if that's okay. <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll try to. I'm trying to avoid that. Yeah, I, I I got a bad reputation, sort of, from power driving poor Andy. And you know, a, a lot of people over the years. What is crazy is the fact that that's been forty years ago. Wow, forty years ago. And as you can see, still to this day, that's the first thing people ask me about. Literally, I get asked about Andy Kaufman at least once a day, every single day for the past forty years. So that's that's the kind of a impact that that Andy had on not just uh, not just on my career, but on wrestling in general. A lot of people, I was talking to Triple H not long ago, and, and the, you know, it's the general consensus by a lot of people that Andy and I, the match that we had back in the 82 or 3 or whatever it was, that that, that, that was the beginning of uh, almost like sports entertainment. I, I, I had dinner with The Rock uh, last month, and he actually told me, he said, King, I don't believe I would even be a movie star today if it had not been for you and Andy Kaufman having that match, because that opened the door to wrestling getting integrated with Hollywood. I mean, that was that was the start of it. Before that, it, this it had it, it had never happened. And after Andy and I did that, it kind of opened the floodgates to uh, all the stars getting involved with WrestleMania, bringing Mr. T and yeah. and then uh, Hulk Hogan got in the got in the Rocky movie and all this sort of stuff. So that was that that all. You know, that was all uh, precipitated by good old Andy Kaufman. <laughs> wow, unbelievable. No, and 40 years ago, if, folks, if you haven't checked out the Tales of the Territory with uh, Jerry's episode and, and all of the episodes are just uh, fantastic. And a lot of stuff. I've been a diehard wrestling fan since about 88, Jerry. And um, there's a lot of stuff I didn't I didn't know about either. And I uh, uh, lots and lots of fun there. So that's good. Now, I want to tie in here a little bit with the, the Wrestling Browns fandom and we'll get to how you you know sort of your story as a fan but i wanted to tie this in because i think you'd have a unique perspective on it we heard coming out of the season from the defensive side of the browns it was well sort of the uh, you know inmates running the asylum we heard how wcw and its dying days were like that and jadavian Clowney saying hey i'm only going to play certain downs no accountability on some areas no discipline lack of communication obviously a different sport is pro wrestling but you've been a leader in and been around many wrestling locker rooms. How important is that internal accountability and just having that type of leadership? Well, you, well, you're exactly right. That I mean, that's a key word, leadership. And um, 
uh, and like I said, I've, I've been doing this, believe it or not. I had my first wrestling match in December of 1970. So I've been doing this for 53 years. And wow. I just had a I just had a match last week in Nashville for the uh, Music City Bowl teams, Iowa and, and uh, University of Kentucky. We had a special show for them. So I've been doing it for 53 years. And there's been a lot of changes. Uh, but there's, like you said, a lot of similarities in the in the two uh, industries and i mean a lot of one of the things that a lot of people forget about is the fact that i mean you, you know it's right out there as far as wrestling goes it's entertainment mm -hmm. but so is football i mean there's sports of course number one but you know when you're when you're on television you're talking about ratings and you're talking about the amount of viewership and how much money these guys are making that you know that's the entertainment uh, aspect and and some sometimes these uh, it, it's really necessary in, in wrestling for the entertainers, for the athletes, for the, the talent to be huge names. And, and I think, you know, I think that sometimes that, that certainly happens in football, but I think that the NFL, they really don't want that to happen. They want mm -hmm. people to do, be just fans of the team. And it's really it's counterproductive for the for the players the uh, players on the team to get bigger names than the teams are. But it just inevitably happens because of television. So uh, the leadership comes in. The leadership comes into play. Like uh, I, I'll talk to people about what they've uh, experienced most recently in the WWE with mm -hmm. with Vince McMahon. I mean, he was from day one, uh, basically until now. I mean, he was the consummate leader. And and that comes from the fact that the, it was his company to start with. He started the WWE. Uh, he, he ruled it with an iron fist. I mean, because there was nothing more important to him in the world than his company, the WWE. So, uh, that, I mean, that that's the, the leadership from Vince McMahon is what made that company so successful. And now when you look at, when you look at teams like, um, you know, teams like the Cleveland Browns, uh, I, I, I think it's become it's become uh, just as important for the success of the Browns to have proper leadership. And, you know, that's why we uh, I guess that's why we can't settle on a I mean, a head coach. The old saying is they're hired to be fired, uh, you know, and, and, a, and a lot of that comes from the fact that uh, it's the dissatisfaction from the fans. You know, if, I mean, and 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 the same thing with players getting traded. You know, they, if the fans get dissatisfied with them, all of a sudden you got your general manager sitting up there going, "Oh my gosh, this is looking bad for the team." You know, that that sort of thing. So, uh, the leadership is very important. Uh, I, I I I'm looking right now at you know the fact that we're going to hire a new defensive coordinator, and you got Clowney complaining about you know his playing time and all of this sort of stuff, and and so. Yeah, that's all got to be addressed, and it's got to be addressed by leadership. And and sometimes, I, I mean, I'm not I'm not trying to be uh, negative or anything because I got some uh, one one of my best friends in the world is the equipment manager for the for the Browns, Brad Mellon, right. and uh, he kind of keeps me up on stuff that's going on behind the scenes and that sort of thing. And uh, I, I mean, I can just tell you from like just like yourself and like everybody listening, being a huge Browns fan. I've not, I've not been, you know, I've not been on board with all the moves they made, uh, and and then of course you're, you, when something doesn't turn out well, uh, you you just get a chance to go back and say, gosh, I told them so. Why didn't, why would yeah. they, you know, why wouldn't they listen? That sort of thing. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, I mean, I mean, I'm, the leadership is is very important. I think that's the most important thing on the football team. And, and we're gonna have to see King how that really works out because this analytical mindset of the organization of smart, you know, got, okay. You know, they might have, you know, better schooling than us, but geez, it really seems you could use a tough old school defensive guy who's going to come in and say, eh, eh, no, 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 enough of this nonsense. No, I don't care what the spreadsheet says. You're doing it my way. And I don't know, honestly, from that top spot with Paul D. Podesta, I don't know if they're interested in hiring that type of guy. And that concerns me as a Browns fan. It does me as well. Uh, I've never been a big analytical fan. Um, and and I guess that's maybe, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm a lot older than you, I'm older than most of the, the fans these days. And, and so, like you said, old school. 
But, you know, there's nothing sure in life but change. Everything is going to change. And uh, I think that right now we're in the process of, of, I think, the early days of all the analytical stuff. And then, but that, that, will, that will eventually, I think, in my opinion, will come and go. I don't know. I just think that, uh, I think the more, I don't, I, I, you know, it's, it's just hard to say. I, I don't think the fans, I think the majority of the fans are not on board with all the analytical stuff that, that, that is going on these days. Yeah, I think it all has to be a, a part of it, Jerry, right? It has to be, okay, yeah. information is great. Bill right. Belichick, their story, Bill, Bel- Bill Belichick was using analytics before it was analytics, but he still was able to go on the field. And actually, Bill Cower did a, uh, a interview last week before the Browns game, and he said, look, all the information is great, but it doesn't account for, oh, did the wind change? Is it raining now? Did a guy get injured? So it has you have to have that feel, and that's going to be the interesting part of this year. And boy, boy, we love Kevin Stefanski, year one, coach of the year. It's been a bit of a decline. What were your right. overall thoughts of this season, of this Brown season, with the whole Deshaun Watson missing 11 games, too? It kind of seemed like we were shot in the foot before things even got going. I think that's a perfect way to perfect way to put it. Um, and now I'm just I'm just talking from my perspective now, you know, of being a fan of certain guys of certain things that that have happened with the Browns. Uh, but like you said before, I'm a diehard Browns fan. No matter what, I'm living yeah. and dying, uh, you know, brown and orange. Uh, so, but a lot of things have have happened that uh, I've not been happy with. I was not happy with the way that uh, that things worked out with Baker Mayfield. I thought that Baker should have give, been given another chance uh, when he was healthy. Uh, and then, and then when that went South, uh, I, I don't, I don't know. I wasn't, I was never, I was never a fan of the Deshaun Watson move. Uh, I'm just telling it like it is, you know, he, and I'm just, I'm so much of a Browns fan that I don't really, I don't really keep up with what's going on on other teams. Mm-hmm. I had not followed Deshaun Watson. I didn't know what a great quarterback he had been in the past. I just knew that uh, you know I was I was a Baker Mayfield guy, and 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 uh, I, I thought that was our, our going to be our future. And then all of a sudden, when uh, you know when when things went south with Baker, and I started hearing about Deshaun Watson, I just you know I, I was I was kind of uh, my my mind was already made up uh, sort of against him. And then though. Um, you know, when, when, when he had that, that long sit out, uh, that, like you said, I think that the deck was stacked against the Browns for this season from the get go. And, and, and then, it, then it didn't, it didn't really turn out any better once, you know, once he, once he got involved in games and started playing, I mean, I, I don't know if anybody could actually say that they were really pleased with, uh, you know, with his play. And I understand he hadn't played in 700 days yeah. or something like that when he first started, but, uh, I don't know they, the way they talked about it and the amount of money they paid. Uh, you know, and draft been, picks given up. He should have no draft second, picks. He should have been the second coming, but yeah. uh, you know, it it just hadn't turned out that way. But what what are you going to do? Hey, that's it. You know what? Ultimately, King, it comes down to all right. When the season starts, what's who, who's in the who's in the, the laundry? Who's wearing the uniform? We'll get behind him and whatever. Uh, a couple right. more questions for for, for you. I know your time's very you're very busy. Uh, how did you and I look? I, I, like I said, I've been following you for listening and watching you for a long time. So I have your, I believe your first book. Good, it's good to be the king sometimes. Yeah. So I know how you became a Brown fan from the the story and the and the book. But for those who don't know, like you said, king, you know, King of Memphis. How did the King of Memphis wrestling, Jerry the King Law, become a Browns fan? Well, I was a Browns fan long before I was the King of Memphis wrestling. I was born. I, I was born in here in Memphis, Tennessee, uh, and in when I was seven years old, I'm just a little, little me, just a mere little prince at that time. When I was seven years old, my dad worked at the Ford Motor Company here in Memphis. We had an assembly plant in Memphis, and they had some sort of dispute with the over over the land or something. Anyway, they Ford shut the plant down here in Memphis, and they opened up. They built a plant in actually in Vermilion, Ohio, you know, a few miles west of Cleveland, and so. They gave everybody that worked at the plant here in Memphis, if you want to keep your job, you can transfer and move to Ohio. And and so that's what we did. And when I would, like I said, when I was seven years old, 
we moved to, uh, we actually wound up living in Amherst. I love that little town. My, I was an Amherst Comet and all that sort of stuff and everything. But anyway, we moved to Amherst, lived up there for eight years. And, and, and I was seven when we got there. And of course, coming from Memphis, we had no we had no pro sports teams at all in Memphis. Then we had a minor league baseball, the Memphis Chicks, and that was it. All of a sudden to move in the backyard of the Cleveland Indians with Rocky Calavito and the Cleveland Browns, more importantly, with Jim Brown playing. I mean, I lived in I lived in Ohio in 1964 when the Browns, you know, the last time they won the NFL championship. So I lived in Ohio uh, and got to go to my first Indians game, got to go to my first Browns game when I was just a kid before I even got into wrestling. I mean, uh, I'd, I'd moved back to we moved back to Memphis when I was uh, just a sophomore in high school. Hadn't even even thought about wrestling, but that's uh, you know that's when I became a Browns fan when I lived up there. And when we came back to Memphis, there was still Memphis had still no pro sports teams. Everybody in Memphis was for St. Louis or right. Atlanta or whatever. So I just stayed a Cleveland a Cleveland sports fan my my whole life, and it's it's been wonderful. I mean, one one um, one day I got to meet Sam Ritigliano. Sam came to Memphis. To uh, uh, while while he was head coach, he came to Memphis to as a guest of John Bramlett. I don't know if you remember that name. John just passed away not all that long ago, but John Bramlett was a uh, ex football player, ex NFL player, but he had become a, a pastor and a, an evangelist. And he brought uh, Sam Martigliano down to speak at a fellowship of Christian athletes banquet. And so I got to I got to go over. They stayed up late. I was wrestling in Atlanta that night. And they stayed up late to uh, uh, to let me fly in. I flew in. I landed in Memphis at 12 midnight, and I went over to John Bramlett's house, and they stayed up for me to meet Sam Ritigliano oh. because I was such a big fan. But mainly they stayed up because by then I was I was the king of wrestling, and they stayed up because John Bramlett's sons wanted to meet me. So oh. but it was it was a marriage made in heaven. I got to meet Sam. One of the first things he told me, this was crazy, was uh, – he said, I have a sort of a wrestling back. He said, when I was playing college football, my roommate, my college roommate on the team was Captain Lou Albano. No uh, way. Yeah. That, can you huh. believe that? I, I can believe it. Either. But Captain Lou Albano was roommates with Sam Ritigliano when they played college ball together. So he, he was just the greatest person. He gave me his card, his numbers. And he said, whenever you come up to Cleveland to Berea, this was back when, you know, it was out, in the, out at the – Baldwin Wallace College and everything. He said, "Come out uh, to training and have a meal with the king. I mean, have a meal with the players. The players would like to meet the king and all this sort of stuff." So, um, I mean, I, I I went and he was a man of his word. He was so gracious, and I got to meet so many players and become became friends with so many. Eddie Johnson. Oh my gosh, you remember Eddie Johnson? Yes. Yes. Oh, oh my gosh. I mean, I got to meet so many of these guys. Eddie Johnson convinced me or, or talked me into bringing him a wrestling mask because, you know, he was the assassin. Right. And I brought him a wrestling mask that he actually wore in a game uh, against, I think, against Denver and got in all kinds of trouble. <laughs> he wore that under his helmet ah. uh, with Marty Schottenheimer. And, and Eddie told me later, I swear, my, my mask disappeared from my locker room after after that game. And I think uh, I think he said, I always believe Marty took my mask. But anyway, I mean, I've, I've known all of these different guys, uh, the the different uh, Bernie Kozar I got to meet, and, and, and all of these different guys through the years. And it's just been a, a great relationship. That's amazing. Thanks for sharing that. That's incredible. Uh, wow. I love that. Jerry, before we let you go, on a more serious note, you have a very relatable story to uh, the the news. And thank goodness, Demar Hamlin out of the Buffalo Bills. It looks like he's doing better. I believe latest is he's home and recuperating. Uh, terrifying moment on the field. Um, but for yourself, I believe just about t uh, ten years ago, past September, uh, yes. you had your own near death experience on the air, which I remember vividly. It was it was uh, shocking, and uh, you know everybody praying and it was it was very scary you obviously made it through but if you could share that with us because that this is you know very topical the in-game um type of, of trauma right well exactly i mean exactly to the t the same thing happened to uh the the, the player the bills player that had happened to me 10 years ago uh, i got 
I got in my case, I was wrestling in the match. Uh, me and and oh gosh, was it CM Punk? Well, anyway, it was against Dolph Ziggler and and uh, CM Punk, right. and it was me and Randy Orton were partners. And during that match, CM Punk dropped several elbows. I mean, he jumped in the air as high as he could, dropped several elbow elbows on my chest, and um. I, I'll never forget. I remember saying, thinking to myself at that time, saying, wow, whatever happened to the time we used to do this and not kill each other. And sure enough, uh, one of those, one of those elbows, uh, just like the football player, it hit my chest at the exact right moment that in the middle of one of my heartbeats and, you know, ordinarily your heart is beating like this. And when it gets a blow at the right time, it will start fibrillating like this. Okay. And if you, if you notice, you saw the football player actually stand up and stand there for a second before his heart actually stopped at that time, his heart was fibrillating and then it seized up and that's the cardiac arrest. And that's when he passed out. Mine started fibrillating during that match and did it for nine minutes before it seized up and stopped. Oh. I had already got down and went over to sit at the commentary desk and then my heart stopped and I fell over just like he did uh, on live TV and uh, with a cardiac arrest. And my, when I when I saw the player, when I saw that, when I saw him go down exactly three minutes after it happened, I put out a tweet that said I would be willing to bet that he has just suffered a cardiac arrest. I know from experience. Mm -hmm. And it was it. it worked out exactly the same way it did with me. If he had not, if those guys had not come out as this, the same way with me, our, our company doctor was sitting right at ringside. We were live on the air, worldwide TV, uh, Monday Night Raw. And our company doctor was literally sitting right beside me when I fell over out of my chair. And he immediately started the CPR just as the players, uh, just as the players coaches did. And that's, you know, that's what saves your, that's what saves your life. His heart wasn't beating as mine wasn't. Uh, they were able to get the, they were able to shock him on the field. It was 22 minutes before they were able to shock me. But once they get your heart shocked back and started back on the right rhythm, if the CPR has been given properly, you, you suffer no damage and they will hmm. keep you as I, same thing. They took me to the hospital. They had me uh, like in a coma with a tube down my throat. For four days, they just do that to, you know, to make sure you're recuperating and you haven't had any brain damage. Or everything. Same thing with him. They kept him under for a few days. But then as soon as they bring you out, you're as good as new. I mean, I guarantee you, you know, I mean, you really you, you wake up and your heart's back on the normal rhythm. And it's like it never happened. And I and I've, I've watched his uh, I watched his recovery. And it's the same thing. When he came to, when they, and what they do, you know, they keep you under with this propofol, actually, is what it is. And as soon as they cut that drip off, you wake up and it's like it never, it's like nothing ever happened. If you remember, he said his first words was, Did we win the game? Yeah. And that's yeah. the way it was. When, when I woke up four days later, uh, you know, my girlfriend was there and I said, Are we still in Aruba? Which is where he, we had been the day before the, uh, the cardiac arrest, you know. So, um, I, I, I predict that he will be fine as I have, I never had another minutes problem since then. And, and I don't think that he will either. Unbelievable, unbelievable story. Wow. Well, uh, Jerry, just absolutely remarkable. Uh, this has been a real treat for, for me, for the viewers, of course, listen, you're on Twitter at, at Jerry Lawler, 1.4 million followers. I'm sure people know where to find you there, but Anything else you want to, uh, you know, books? I know you're a heck of an artist too. Anything else you want to share where people can find you? Oh gosh, um, oh gosh, I got. Uh, well, we got we got the, um, of course, Royal Rumble is coming up in a couple of weeks. We yes. also got the thirtieth and uh, the thirty fifth anniversary of Monday Night Raw, which is going to be in Philadelphia, and I'll be at I'll be at that. That's coming up uh, in, in a couple of weeks as well. And I'm gonna I'm gonna if I can I'm gonna grab my I'm gonna grab my phone here. And take you guys on a little quick tour sure. uh, to let you just see my one of my uh, crazy rooms here. If I can, I'm going to turn my I want to turn my camera around and see if you can see what's what's going on here. Oh, that's Hulk and uh, Superman. Ba is that the Batmobile? That's the Batmobile. <laughs> no way. Bat yeah. Oh my gosh! Wow. 
some of oh. my outfits and that sort of thing. Oh, some of my God. championship belts. But here's uh here's wow, that's a big guy right there. There he is. But here's uh <laughs> here's one of the things I wanted to show you right here. Oh, there it is. Look at that, folks. Oh man. Look at that. I see a bunch of autographs too. Oh yeah. Wow. Yeah, Indians, this, is, Browns. this is signed by the 1964 championship team. No every way. Player. Yep. Wow. That's unbelievable. There's me and Bernie. I don't know if you see me and Bernie there. There we go. I got that same card. There you go. <laughs> that's about the only thing that's similar. <laughs> do, you, do you have a picture with him like this one? You know what? I on on my phone, but much later, like three years ago. That that picture is much cooler. <laughs> Look at yeah. that! Wow, that's some cool stuff. I love it. That's incredible. Kenny Lofton, Kenny Lofton game use bat that he gave me. Oh, gee, you, you got to sell tickets, Jerry. People will come and <laughs> come just to see this. Well, I'm I'm really thinking about doing that. Believe it or not. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> And Count me in for two. Oh, Lee. Oh, wow. That's spectacular. Yeah, all, sort of, all kinds of crazy stuff. That's amazing. <laughs> well, that, that Browns memorabilia, that's incredible. The 64 helmet and all that. Jeez. Is Bernie your, your all-time favorite QB? Is that is that your guy? Yeah, Bernie would be my all-time favorite. I just I just talked to Bernie. I can't believe what what's happened with Bernie now. I know. Do you see, like, Jerry, do you see that the Dolphins firing Dan Marino? Do you see the 49ers firing Joe Montana? Get out of your own way, Browns. Good Lord. The I know. I made a pretend bet to, to, to help promo because legal gambling came to Ohio. Can we give the man a break? He's a legend. Right. Oh, my Drives goodness. Me nuts. Drives me nuts. <laughs> Is he doing okay? You talked to me. Is he doing good? Well, I, I actually just got a text from him. I haven't, I haven't talked to him since. But, uh, I understand that he said everything's going to be okay, you know. Okay. Hopefully they smart. Yeah, it's just it's like you said. Come on, sometimes it seems like they can't get out of their own way. We've had we've had what thirty something quarterbacks since ninety nine. Can we can we keep happy the one that wants to be associated with us, please? <laughs> isn't, isn't that the truth? <laughs> he's the he's probably the only one alive who wants to still be considered a Brown. Come on. You're right. That's exactly right. right. Goodness. Oh, geez. Well, Jerry, this is thank you for the the behind the scenes. That, oh, that's no absolutely incredible. Um, thank you so much. Listen, at Jerry Log, 35th anniversary of Monday Night Raw. Man, that makes me feel old. I watched the first one. Oh my gosh. Um <laughs> make sure you tune into that. Royal Rumble. Jerry the King Lawler. Stay tuned. We're gonna have a lot more coming. To NFL best bets coming up for the playoffs. One other thing I'm one other thing I'm just looking at here. Another reason that uh, 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 Cleveland has always been near and dear to my heart is because of this right here. I mean, oh, Superman. It's right at the airport. Yeah. Well, Cleveland, Cleveland is the birthplace of Superman. That's right. I mean, wow. it wasn't Krypton. I mean, you know, <laughs> Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster, both their homes. I've visited both their homes there in Cleveland, Ohio. And uh, people can still go by and see their homes right, almost right, right downtown Cleveland. And oh, really? uh, that's where that's where Superman was born. Yeah. That's, and right at the Cleveland Airport too, at uh, Hopkins, they got yeah, right. There's a, yeah, there's a big display there. At the display. Airport. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, of course you got Superman there. Have you have you been by the Christmas Story House? I went by there yes. for the first time <laughs> last year. That's another thing. Yeah, I'm, I'm very good friends with several of the uh, actors: Scotty Schwartz, who was Flick, oh. and <laughs> uh, and Zach, who was Scott Farkas. Uh, very good friends of those. Matter, matter of fact. Scotty showed up at my house one Christmas day just to come in and watch the Christmas Story movie. He ah. knew I was such a fan of it. Did you see the new one? I did, and I loved it. I liked it. I thought it was a nice, a nice, a nice tribute to the old man. That was cool. I actually, I actually shed a tear or two during it. I liked. I, I was it. close. I was close as well. It was very, <laughs> very nice. Oh, that's great. Well, Jerry, you know what? Hey, let's let's have you on again before the start of the next season. Hopefully, we get some positivity. And, uh, you know, go, go Browns and uh, Royal Rumble and 35th anniversary of Raw coming up. Thank you so much, Jerry. Okay, man. Thank you. All right. There he is, Jerry, the King Waller. My goodness. Absolutely phenomenal. All right, everybody. Time to earn some money. Hopefully. NFL wildcard weekend. A lot of action coming up. Games on Saturday, Sunday, Monday. Let's get to some sick picks. It's time for sick picks. That's right. Brought to you by Bet Fred Sportsbook. Ohio, it's here. It's here. 
You know it already. You've been laying your bets. You know. Bet Fred Sportsbook. Link to the in the description of the show where you can get exclusive big bonuses. Like, folks, over a thousand bucks bonus and bets. Come on. Over a thousand bucks. Where else, who's else is going to? No one's giving you that except for old Andy here. Bet Fred Sportsbook in the description. Weekly prizes. We had one earlier a few weeks back. Autographed Nick Chubb jersey. Whole bunch more fun stuff coming up there. All you got to do, register, make that first deposit, and that gets you qualified. So you're right in the action there. Also, if you're fantasy football, see if you're the commissioner, you want to celebrate your own victory, you can get championship belts. You can get championship trophies from my guys at Trophy Smack. And if you order one of those, you get a free championship ring from Trophy Smack. They're the guys that Mark Cuban uh, partly bought on Shark Tank. Super great guys. Love Matt and the boys on at Trophy Smack. So that link is in there as well, as well as the merchandise shop for the show. Get your fantasy champion shirt, your professional fantasy football shirt. You can get that there as well as some really fun Browns gear as well. You got the full Chubb shirt. You got the Browns fan shirt, all sorts of good stuff, all there in the show description. Click the notifications, click the links, and Thanks again to Jerry Lawler. My goodness, that was a tour of his, of his home and, and the memorabilia. Sensational. Let's get to some sick picks, though. All right. We're going to go through game by game here, a little quick hitter. So first of all, Saturday, we start 9-8 and eight Seattle Seahawks at the 13-4 and four San Francisco 49ers. Niners, nine and a half point favorites. Now, the Geno Smith story, it's been a fun one, right? They've come back down to earth, okay? And when you look at this matchup, um, you're, you're looking at it from the angle of, okay, the Niners defense the declining point production of the Seahawks. Also, this is per ESPN Stats and Info. San Francisco's led the NFL in yards after the catch for the sixth straight year. Christian McCaffrey, 41.4. Debo Samuel, 37.9. Second and third in yak per game. Seattle's defense, meanwhile, 31st in yards after the catch allowed per reception. So what does that mean? It means Christian McCaffrey and Debo Samuel are going to do what they do. They're going to catch the ball from Brock Purdy. (laughs) You're going to get a lot of yards. I think that nine and a half point, I think you do it. It pays minus 115. You know, not the best payout, but minus 115 for the Niners to cover that. I I just, unless there's some catastrophic injury, they're too well coached and they're just cruising right now. Now, prop play for that game. Take Brock Purdy over one and a half passing touchdowns. Minus 105 payout, so not bad. Purdy's thrown for two or more touchdowns in all of the six starts. Right. And again, you don't have to bomb it down the field. Get it to Christian McCaffrey. Get to Debo. Have yourself a day. Niners take it going away. Do that prop play over one and a half passing touchdowns. Then we got Chargers 10 and 7 at the Jaguars 9 and 8. Chargers two and a half point road favorites. Now, this this comes down to a little bit for me, a little bit of the, the gut feeling. The Chargers always find a way to kind of screw things up, right? Whereas you look at Doug Peterson. Trevor Lawrence and the Jacksonville Jaguars. And lo and behold, this team has won five in a row. They're cruising. They believe in themselves. Doug Peterson has erased the stink from Trevor Lawrence that Urban Meyer put on. This team's got, it's America's sweetheart team here. Nobody believes that they're going to do any damage in the playoffs. I don't think they really will either. But against the Chargers, boy, I think they could. I think they could, and again, they're rolling after five straight wins, and I think you get that that feel-good story. So uh, two-and-a-half-point road dogs or road uh, uh, home dogs are the Jaguars. I'm taking Jacksonville here. Prop play. Double dip on Austin Eckler props. What a season for Austin Eckler. Got to meet him in Vegas at the NFL draft uh, back in April. Great dude. Great, very nice guy. I'm going over the four-and-a-half receptions, minus 160 in this game. Under 51-and-a-half rushing yards, minus 115. Eckler's only rushed for more than 51 yards six times all year. And less than that in his past three, which included a loss to the Jacksonville Jaguars. So we have some relatable um, things here. And in that loss to the Jags, Eckler uh, corralled in eight passes. So I think that prop play makes some sense. Let's move to Sunday now. Dolphins at the Bills, 9-8 and eight Dolphins, Bills 13-3. and three. Buffalo, 13-point home favorite. Folks, first of all, I think I'd stay away from this game. I think this is going to be an absolute smash, smash job by the Bills. They're going with Skylar Thompson, the Miami Dolphins. Two is not playing. Teddy Bridgewater's iffy at best. They say they might make him a backup in an emergency. If Teddy Bridgewater was playing in this game as a starter, full week to trade, you might be able to talk me into the, the Dolphins covering. Skylar Thompson. Let's, let's look at the facts. 
you got an emotionally charged Buffalo Bills team who's riding high off the emotion of DeMar Hamlin getting better. Oh, by the way, they're just exceptional. And you're at home. Division game be damned. Buffalo takes this one outright. Again, I wouldn't really put any cash on this one, but if the payout just doesn't make sense. But if you have some angle, Buffalo 13, make it 20. I don't care. Buffalo's winning this one. Then Giants, 9-7-1 at the Vikings, 13-4. and Minnesota, three-point home favorites. Now, this Vikings team, check out this, folks. The Vikings had 11 of their 13 victories come by one score. One score. That means that 13-4 and four could have been flipped on its head super easy. 11 of the 13 by one. They're the they're, they're purple people leader version of the Cardiac Kids. And that included their last second 61-yard field goal by former Browns kicker Greg Joseph to beat the Giants on Christmas Eve. So it's probably the fakest 13-4 and four I've seen, but they got it done. Do they get it done today? Brian Dable, heck of a coaching job. Him, it's, to me, it's between him and Doug Peterson for coach of the year. You took that Giants team not only to a plus 500 record, but to the playoffs with Daniel Jones? Whew. Boy, good on him. But I think it comes to an end. Key for New York, you got to control the ball. You have to keep it in the hands of Saquon Barkley and Daniel Jones design runs. You got to do it. If you do that, you got a shot. Otherwise, what does Kirk Cousins have to do? Just chuck it up to the unstoppable monster known as Justin Jefferson. What a. What a player, what a season. Just throw 12 catches, doesn't matter. Justin Jefferson is putting up e video game on easy numbers every single game. Prop play like Dalvin Cook, under 70 and a half rushing yards. He's rushed for under 70 yards in four of his past five, and that includes the win over the Giants. Let's go to Ravens, 10 and 7 at the Bengals, 12 and 4 to AFC North teams. Now, in a perfect world, they both lose for us Browns fans, right? But who do I want to lose more? Well, it's definitely the Ravens. I can't stand the Raptors. I hate them. I don't want anything nice for them. And I don't think they're going to get anything nice. Lamar Jackson still, still not practicing. He's not going to play. And what have I told you two and a half to three years ago before it was cool? Even now it's not cool. But I didn't shy away from it. I said, Lamar Jackson's longevity, eh -eh, not going to happen. You cannot be a run-only quarterback. Take the stats out of it for his passing. Not a good passer. Defense's strategy is still to make Lamar Jackson throw the ball. And if that's your strategy, you don't have a true franchise quarterback. Lamar wanted to represent himself? Great. How much money did you cost yourself, pal? Ravens aren't signing you to a five-year fully guaranteed contract. That being said, they'll, I'm sure they'll franchise tag him. He's, he'll still get 20 mil guaranteed. We should all have those type of problems, right? To the game itself. Cincinnati, nine and a half point favorites. You have Tyler Huntley, who's not 100% either. And Tyler Huntley's below average. That's putting it nicely. So then you're on the third string guy. The defense keeps this close. And that's where that nine and a half points eats at me a little bit. But the Cincinnati Bengals, they feel they've been slighted by the NFL after that canceled game. They're at home. I think they make a statement here. I think they make a statement. I think they win that game, even though it is a tough Baltimore defense. Again, that nine and a half makes me a bit nervous. But... I'm going to take it. Bengals by nine and a half. Prop play. I like the T. Higgins anytime touchdown. Plus 150. Seven touchdowns on the season for Higgins. Been in and out of the lineup a bit with injury. But he has four in his last five. And he, he's missed a little practice with an illness. Looks like that's not going to be an issue. The Monday nighter. Cowboys. 12 and five at the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Eight and nine. Cowboys. Two and a half point road favorites. Folks, this comes down to me just thinking. Tom Brady playoff factor is there a stat you can point to is there a, not really and not with this team but brady if you look at his stats actually statistically had a good year the cowboys on paper should win this game but the fact that's two and a half vegas knows vegas knows something would it surprise anybody if the tampa bay buccaneers beat the dallas cowboys and if the cowboys lose i bet you mike mccarthy gets fired by jerry jones they had big expectations. Jerry wasn't. Jerry Jones wasn't afraid to come out and say they want Super Bowl. They, they want a long run. You don't get past Brady first round to an 8-9 team that won the division, back their way in. But Tom Brady, of course, knows how to win. I got to say, folks, I'm going to take. I'm going to take the uh, the Buccaneers outright. Plus 120 for a straight up victory. Would any of you really be that shocked if Tampa Bay won? Plus 120. I think it's worth the risk. I'll go Tampa Bay and Tampa beat Dallas in week one. Take that for what you want. Prop play. 
Also in week one, Mike Evans had a touchdown against the Cowboys, and he had three last week. Inconsistent season the whole the whole year for this whole Bucks team. But any time touchdown for Mike Evans, any time touchdown pays plus 150. Big target, end zone, comfort with Tom Brady. Does that not make a lot of sense? Plus 150 anytime TD for Mike Evans? I think so. I think so a lot. I'm going to take that for sure. So there you go. Any fantasy football DFS questions you got, hit me up on Twitter. Use hashtag AskAndy on uh, at AndyMC81 at SickPodBrowns. Instagram at AndyMC Sports. Make sure you click notifications. Make sure you share this episode. Jerry the King Lawler. Phenomenal. Browns fan, wrestling legend. If you missed any of that, go back and watch it. Share it. Notifications. Leave a comment too. Always love that. For Sammy, for Jerry Lawler, and to all of you, thank you so much. I'm Andy McNamara. You've been listening to the Sick Podcast with Andy McNamara. Go Browns! And that's a wrap. Hope you don't miss us too much until next time. Follow the Sick Podcast with Andy McNamara on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, Google Play, and Apple Podcasts.